Hello, so my name is Grace Kim. I am the equine and companion animal extension assistant for 4-H. Um, tonight's equine webinar will be over horse color genetics with uh, Dr. Peterson. This recording, if you guys are not able to get on tonight or want to see it again later, will be on our equine webinar uh, page and our YouTube page is where you can find this recording. If any of, any of you that are on tonight have a question for Dr. Peterson as she's going through her PowerPoint, you are welcome to type something in the chat box or you're always welcome to wait at the end of the PowerPoint. So I will turn this over to Dr. Peterson for the webinar. All right, thank you, Grace. Um, I hope everybody can hear me okay. Um, I I'm Jessica Peterson. I'm fortunate to be one of the faculty members in the Department of Animal Science at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Um, in particular, I work in the animal breeding and genetics group. Um, my lab studies beef cattle and horses. Um, I'm interested in finding out how different parts of the genome or different mutations alter how our animals perform, whether that be how they do in the feedlot um, or how they do on the racetrack and everything in between. Um, I'm also one of those people who was born with the horse gene. I'm pretty sure there is a gene that some of us have that make us just inherently love horses. Um, and so I always like the opportunity to talk about horse genetics. Um, so Dr. Luck and Grace asked me today to talk about coat color genetics. Um, so that's what our topic is. I'm going to start out with a little bit of basics. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the biology of some of the basic mechanisms of horse coat color. Um, but then we'll go through some of the more common modifications and white patterns that we see in horses. Um, I think this is a particularly fun time of year to think about color genetics um, because all of our new foals are being born. So you can look at that foal and sometimes it's still a mystery as to what color it might, might be when it sheds out. Um, and also if you're breeding horses, it's also fun to think about what color might I get from this particular cross. So. Um, so why color genetics? I just I told you some of my favorite reasons. Um, it's often the first thing that we notice or describe about a horse. And if you talk to people who don't, um, don't think about horses as much as we might, they'll describe a horse as that spotted horse or that brown horse. Um, so co coat color is definitely a defining factor for horses. Um, they're also potentially um, descriptive of a breed. There's some breeds that are um, derived around different coat colors or coat color patterns. Um, and then, like I said, you can use coat color and what coat colors parents have to think about the out outcome of matings. Um, the last point on that slide is something that I will touch on a little bit, um, is that some color variants or mutations that cause particular coat colors are also associated with other conditions, um, and sometimes not things we want, such as disease type conditions. So when we're thinking about genetics, um, the horse's genetics are, are found in its genome. Um, and this picture is called a karyotype, and it's visualizing each of the chromosomes of a horse. Um, so in humans, we have 23 pairs of chromosomes. Horses have 31, um, and if the horse is a female, it then has two X chromosomes, like this horse, or if it's a male, it has one X and one Y chromosome. Um, but all of the variants that we're talking about are carried on one particular part of the horse's genome. And just a background again, um, every foal inherits one copy of each chromosome from each of its parents. This particular foal has um, this chromosome that it inherited from its father and this chromosome from its mother. And that's the, that's the case across the whole entire genome. So a little bit of terminology and then we'll get away from these text heavy slides and look at pictures of horses. Um, a variation of a gene is called an allele and I'll use that word a lot tonight. Um, allele is just a variation of a, any particular part of the genome we are interested in. Um, because every individual has half of their genome from mom and half from dad, um, one allele at every single marker in the genome comes from the stallion and one from the mare. Um, those are carried on those chromosomes. 
And so we often use letters to describe the different variations or different alleles at each part of the genome. Um, in this case, I'm using a big A and a little a to denote that the allele that this foal inherited from its mom on the pink chromosome is a different allele than it inherited from its dad. Um, the combination of those two alleles then is called a genotype. And so if I said, what is this horse's genotype at this particular location? I would combine those two alleles and I would probably say big A, little a. Um, and then two terms you might hear um, quite a bit when stallions, especially um, paint stallions or, or other colored breeds are advertised is heterozygous, which means the two alleles from in that particular horse are two different alleles, um, or homozygous, which means both alleles are of the same variety, if you will. Um, and again, if we use our letter designations, a heterozygous animal has our big A, little a, um, and homozygous can be little a, little a, or conversely, it could be homozygous for the big A allele. What we really are interested in when we're thinking about what color a horse is going to be or a horse is given its genotype depends upon the, how those two alleles at each of those locations in the genome interact with one another. Um, and so we, I want to introduce the, trait, uh, the terms, I'm sorry, dominant and recessive. Um, this describes, again, how that interaction takes place between those two alleles and not necessarily um, has anything to do with how common that particular trait might be. Um, in, in everyday um, language, we might say something is dominant because we see it most often. Um, that's not the case in how we use the word in genetics. Um, and so for our example, we'll go right to horse coat color. So at one particular marker in the genome, the E locus, there's two alleles. Um, we're gonna use the letter E the dominant allele is the big E. So we often use the capital letters to denote the dominant allele and the, the recessive allele is a little e. So if a dominant allele is present, it will determine the color. So in the case of our black horse, this black horse could have genotype big E, little e. And even though there's a little e there, because there's a big E, it's gonna cover up the effects of that little e and the horse will be black. The recessive allele then is only seen if there's two of them present at one time. So the recessive allele is only seen if there's not one of the dominant alleles. So the genotype then of that red horse is little e, little e, which means it inherited a little e allele from both parents. I'm not gonna talk a lot about these things that determine coat color with the exception of, of the first two. Um, in, in, this, in this PowerPoint. Um, the E locus that I just talked about and we'll talk about more um, actually denotes the gene melanocortin-1 receptor. And that's a big long name um, that usually gets abbreviated for M as MC1R. Um, and this is the major switch in determining horse coat color. Um, but I have this, these other pictures up because I wanna point out that all mammals have about 20,000 or maybe a little more than 20,000 different genes in the genome. Um, and even though all of these mammals on this picture look different from one another, they actually have pretty much the same 20,000 genes. The difference is we have a little bit different variation in each of those genes. And the way in which those genes are expressed or the timing of when, when they are expressed will differ between species. Um, but this gene MC1R that determines whether your horse is black or red um, is actually the same gene that different variants in cattle determine if it's a black Angus or a red Angus. And Labradors determine if it's a black lab or a yellow lab. And people will determine if um, you have red hair. And it doesn't always um, have to do with red color. And so an example from our, our research group in my lab we found that there's variation in the gene MC1R that determines whether this yak will have a gray nose or whether it will have a dark black nose, like the calf. So MC1R is found in all mammals. It just happens that the variation present in horses is one of the major factors that determine whether or not the horse is red or black. 
Um, and so a lot of people might be familiar with, with the big E locus in horses, um, but a lot of times we don't think about how it actually works to turn that horse black um, versus red. And when I say red, I guess I haven't said, I mean sorrel or chestnut. It kind of depends upon what breed you grew up with and what you call um, that particular red color. Um, so this is one of the cartoons I have. Um, so this box is a cell. Um, this particular cell is called a melanocyte, which means it's a cell that produces pigment. If you remember um, the long name of this gene, MC1R, that R stands for a receptor. And a receptor's job is to sit on the outside of a cell <clears throat> and it relays a message from the outside of the cell to the inside of the cell. In this particular case, this MC1R receptor is right here on the edge of the cell. In a normal situation, a, a protein called MSH will come and bind to this receptor. So it's basically telling it a message. The receptor then relays that message to the inside of the cell. And in this case, it's telling it to produce eumelanin, which is a dark pigment. So when this receptor is functioning, it binds to this protein MSH and it creates dark pigment. When the little e allele is present, that is a mutation of that melanocortin-1 receptor. And it actually functions, um, the mutation functions to make the receptor not work correctly. So we can think about it as in, even if somebody's trying to send a message from the outside of the cell to the inside, that message doesn't get relayed because this receptor is broken. And in the case where the message doesn't get relayed into the cell, um, that cell produces theomelanin or light colored pigment and then the horse's body is red. <clears throat> but you'll say, black and red. Um, and so here's some of my favorite colors of horses. And if you'll look at the ones on the left that are boxed in red compared to the ones on the right that are boxed in black, um, the difference between these two groups of four horses is that the ones on the red only have little E alleles at that MC1R locus. Um, they don't have any black on their bodies. They're all red base color, while the horses on the right all have black on their points. So their legs, their mane and their tail, often their ear tips. Um, and so this Appaloosa horse here, we can see it's black in its mane. Sometimes you can't see the black legs if there's white markings, um, but these horses are all black base coat color. And so all those horses have at least one big E at that MC1R locus. <clears throat> okay, so then let's go to these two horses. Um, there's a, a black mare on the left and a bay mare on the right. Um, and I know that their genotype at MC1R is big E, little e. The fact that they have a big E means that they have black points. And so you can see both these horses have black manes and tails and legs. Um, that little e really doesn't matter because the big E is dominant and covers it up. Um, so they have a black base coat, but clearly they're not the same color. So um, the next gene we're going to talk about is what modifies black into bay. So that locus is called the A locus. Um, the gene is a GUDI signaling protein, abbreviated ASIP, and it affects the distribution of black hairs. And you can only see what's happening at this locus, at the A locus, when there's a big E allele at MC1R. And if we think about it, the big E allele is necessary to allow the message to get into the cell through the melanocortin-1 receptor to make black pigment. Um, if that can't happen and there's no black pigment, it doesn't matter where that black pigment is supposed to be. Um, you can't see black pigment on a sorrel horse so this gene doesn't matter if your horse is sorrel. So the alleles for duty, we name them big A and little a. Big A is the dominant allele. And if a horse has the big A allele, it restricts the black to only the points of the horse, or in other words, it results in a bay colored horse. The little a allele doesn't restrict the distribution of black hairs. And so the horse is black all over its body um, in what we just simply call black horse. But again, we only see these A alleles in the A genotype um, when that big E allele is present at MC1R. 
I'm going to go um, oh, oh, this slide first. And so in this case, I will say that this bay horse's genotype is big E little e. And again, I might not know what this second allele is at the MC1R locus. Um, in this case, this is, this is my mare, and I know that she has a little e allele. Um, and big A and something else. And I use a little um, underscore here to show that, sorry, that there's another allele present, um, but we don't necessarily know what it is. It could be another big A, which wouldn't change what we see. It could be a little A, which again wouldn't change what we see because that little A is recessive to the big A. A black horse, however, has to have at least one big E um, and it has two little A's because if it had any big A's, it would be bay instead. So we're gonna go back to that cartoon. I think this is fun. I hope you do too. Um, we say in genetic speak that MC1R is epistatic over ASIP. Um, that just means that MC1R um, is, is a master switch over what happens at this other gene, ASIP. So in our cartoon again, in a normal situation with a big E, the message gets relayed from MC1R into the cell and dark pigment is made. Um, but because all horses have a gene ASIP, that gene is gonna be making protein. Um, so in this particular case, if that protein is a little a allele, um, that protein is gonna be hanging out here, but it can't interact with the cell. So this MSH continues to bind, it continues to send its message into the cell and black pigment continues to be made. Um, and it doesn't change anything about, about what that cell does. However, if we have a horse that has a big A allele at ASIP, it's going to make a protein um, from that gene. That protein actually competes with MSH and it binds this receptor instead of what normally does. And as a result, it binds that receptor the message that MSH wanted to send to the cell doesn't get sent properly, and instead that cell makes um, yellow or red pigment in the case of our horses. And so um, this is what happens in our bay horse, is that the hairs in this part of her body that aren't on the points um, are getting the message from the big A allele ASIP saying, I'm not sure what you're trying to say, so I'm just gonna keep making light colored pigment. And then if we have the case again where the um, MC1R genotype is little e lily, that means that this receptor is broken and it's not gonna relay a message no matter what other um, protein comes along and tries to bind it. And so that's why horses with the genotype little e lily are always red. Okay, so I hope I haven't lost you. Um, it's I, I like to think about, like I said at the beginning, what color foals might be, um, but we can also use what we just talked about to think about what genotype do parents have in situations where we might not know for sure. Um, and so in this little example, I'm gonna pretend that I mated this um, sorrel stallion to the black mare. Our stallion is sorrel, he's a red horse, there's no black points. So I know that his genotype for MC1R has to be little e, little e. Um, and because that receptor isn't working, I have no idea if this horse has a big A or a little A or, or both um, at the ASIP locus. So I'm just gonna put question marks there. The black horse, though, we already talked about, has to have one of the big E's. We don't know what the second one is for sure. Um, and it also has to have two little A's um, because those little A's are necessary to keep that message going into that cell across the whole body to keep making black pigment. Okay, so in my hypothetical mating, um, these horses had that foal. And um, I think we'd agree that this foal is bay, has black points, so black mane and tail. And babies, it's kind of hard to see where their black legs are gonna be, but um, trust me, this one will have black legs. And so we can think about at the MC1R locus, this foal had to have a big E. We know that big E had to have come from dad because mom didn't have one to give to him. And we also know that because the foal is bay and not fully black himself, he must have inherited a big A allele. And if we look at dad's genotype, dad only had a little A to give to the foal. So that tells us that mom 
must have at least one big A in her genotype, or dad, I'm sorry, I'm mixing up my parents. The sorrel parent must have had at least one big A in its genotype. And so through this mating, I learned more about the genotype um, of that sorrel horse. I still can't say anything for sure about what's going on at the MC1 locus at the black horse. If I repeated this mating many, many times and only got foals with black points, I might be able to um, speculate that there's also another big E at that locus, um, but we can't be sure um, unless we genetically test it or do lots and lots of matings. So here's my other example um, about learning about a parent's genotype from the foal. Um, this is a cross that a good friend of mine tried over and over again, and she really wanted to get a bay baby, which you think would be fairly likely, and she never did. Um, but in this case, both parents are bay. They have black points, so they have a big E. Um, their black is restricted to the point, so they have a big A. And they have some other second allele at each locus because they have to have two. Um, and if their baby was sorrel, like this one, that tells us that that baby has to have little e, little e genotype, which tells us then that both of those parents are heterozygous or each carry a little e themselves. Um, in the case of this foal, we still have question marks here for the ASIP locus um, because although it, he, he or she might have a big A, since both parents could have potentially given one to him, both parents could have also had a little a there. And so there's a chance that that, um, that that foal has a little a um, or, or two at that locus. Okay, so sorrel or red, black and bay are our main base colors of horses. Um, we're gonna talk about dilutions a little bit now. Um, I'm gonna mention silver and champagne here in this slide, and then I'm gonna go into more detail with dun and cream because those are ones that um, are pretty easy to get confused. So silver sometimes, is sometimes called silver dapple. Um, it's a dominant mutation. The allele is called Z. Um, I'm not exactly sure where Z came from, but that's what um, it gets called. And what silver does is it dilutes um, dark color on horses. And so this particular horse would otherwise be a bay, so a big E and a big A, but the silver dilution um, washed out, if you will, the mane and the tail, the points, the black points of the horse to be a lighter color. Um, and so if you saw this horse in the field, you might think that's a flaxen um, sorrel or chestnut because you don't see distinct black. Or in fact, it is a, a black base coat, um, but the mane, tail, and points, like I said, have been diluted due to the silver mutation. Um, this mutation is, is fairly common in Rocky Mountain horses. It's in some Icelandics, um, miniature horses, Shetland ponies, um, and some other breeds. This is what it looks like on a black horse. It's pretty striking. It does dilute the body color a little bit, but it dilutes the mane and tail um, quite significantly to what almost looks like a flexin um, on a dark horse. Champagne then also dilutes the body pigment. Um, so we have three examples of champagne here. It's a dominant mutation, which means you only need one copy to have the impact. Um, the allele is called CH. So this is a champagne dilution on an otherwise red sorrel, if you will, horse. Um, I might look at that horse and say that looks like a Palomino. Um, the difference is a champagne mutation also will lighten the eye color. Sometimes it'll have like amber colored eyes. Um, they could be born with, with eyes that are, that are almost blue. Um, and as these horses age, actually, they'll get mottled skin on their muzzles um, and some of the other um, areas where you can see their, their skin fairly easily. Um, a true Palomino horse won't have the modeling and will also have dark colored eyes, unless there happens to be white, of course, around those eyes. <clears throat> um, the picture in the middle then is a champagne dilution on an otherwise bay horse. Um, the champagne tends to, to create a really um, striking kind of uh, metallic sheen to the horse's coat. The black points are still a little bit darker than the body, uh, but they're not dark black. And then on the bottom, this is an otherwise black horse with the champagne dilution. Um, and so you get I, I don't, almost a mocha, I want to say, color to the horse. Um, the points, again, are a little bit darker than the body. Um, 
but it diluted the whole color of that horse. <clears throat> so those are fun. Um, Champagne dilution is in a lot of the um, American gated breeds, Tennessee walkers, fox trotters. Um, it's in some quarter horses as well and in related breeds. Okay, so the two that um, get confused sometimes um, are Dunn and Cream. Dunn is the first one I'm gonna talk about. Um, it is a dominant mutation. Um, the allele is big D if you have the mutation that causes the Dunn color and little d if it does not. Um, this dilution lightens red pigment on the body. Um, the, the key in identifying done, though, is, is what we call primitive markings, or the dorsal stripe down the back, such as that horse that's laying down on the left, um, the tiger stripes of the legs, which are shown really nicely in that horse in the middle, um, and sometimes you can see bars on the shoulders, um, such as the horse on the right. Um, so all these horses have a done mutation. Um, their body color has been diluted and they have these primitive markings. Um, Dunn is dominant. So something that gets tricky sometimes, especially when foals are being born, is that foals sometimes have counter shading down their, down their backbone. So it looks like they might have a stripe down their back. Um, and so, so you'll think, wow, I, how did I get it done? This is great. Um, however, um, a true Dunn They'll, they will maintain that throughout their life. Um, and a true dun has to have a dun parent because that mutation is dominant. So if you have a foal and it looks like it has that stripe down its back, um, but neither parent was done, um, it probably isn't or it can't be a true dun dilution in that horse. So here's some pictures on how dun acts on the three base colors that we're talking about. So on a red horse, if we have a red horse and um, the Dunn dilution, its genotype is going to be little e, little e, big D, and then a question mark because we can't say without um, testing or having more breeding information whether that horse is heterozygous or homozygous for the Dunn locus. Um, but this dilutes the red body into kind of a peach color. You can see the stripes in the legs. They're sometimes harder to see on the sorrel background, um, and we call this a red Dunn. We have a bay horse and we have one or two types of the Dunn dilution. That horse then has a genotype big E, big A, big D. And again, all of these alleles are dominant, so we're not sure what the other one is unless we do some genetic testing. Um, but in this case, a Dunn lightens the red pigment, but it doesn't lighten the black pigment. And so you get the, the dark points, um, that dorsal stripe down the horse's back, um, and then the lighter colored body. And usually a bay that gets diluted to done is just simply called a done. And then finally, our black base coat horse with a done um, allele is what we call a gruyo or a gruya. Depends where you come from, I think. I don't know if there's a correct answer. Um, so again, the black points of the horse aren't diluted much. Um, you can see those stripes on those legs really nicely. Um, the dorsal stripe on this horse's back and then the body color is almost um, a silver or a mouse gray color. And that's the effect of the Dunn allele working on that black pigment. Um, something to note that's different than cream that we're gonna talk about next is that visually you can't tell whether a horse is heterozygous um, for Dunn or homozygous. Um, two copies doesn't have a different impact than only having one copy. Okay, so those are Dunn's. So now let's contrast that with what we call the cream dilution. This is also dominant. We're gonna call it CR, capital CR, if the horse has the, the variant or the allele that causes the, the cream dilution, and a little c if it doesn't. Um, like done, this lightens the red pigment. However, the cream dilution does not cause those primitive markings. There's no dorsal stripe or stripes on the legs um, or bars on the shoulder. <clears throat> Further, this is different than done because it is dominant. So if you have one copy, you do lighten, you have a lightened body color on that horse, but it's additive. So if there's two alleles, you have a bigger effect than just one. So I'll give you those examples. <clears throat> okay, so here's our base red horse again. If we have one copy of the cream dilution, <clears throat> our genotype is little e, little e, big CR, little c, and that gives us a palomino. <clears throat> Both these horses in these two pictures are genetically palomino. Um, just like you can have 
sorrel horses that are the bright red sorrel all the way down to those liver chestnuts, palominos can come in a variety of, of depth of body color. And thus far, even though there's um, researchers working on understanding how that happens genetically, um, we can't yet distinguish um, between this color and this color using genetics. So we have that crane dilution on a bay horse. Um, and again, it lightens the red color. It doesn't lighten the black points and we get a buckskin horse. Um, I should have had a better picture where we could see the top of his back, but he should not have um, a dorsal stripe. The cream dilution doesn't cause the, the dorsal stripe or any stripes on the legs. He should have solid legs. One um, copy of cream on a black horse um, gives you what we call smoky black. And this is one that a lot of people could look at and not ever necessarily guess um, for sure what its genotype is because that done, oops, sorry, that, or I'm sorry, that cream allele dilutes red color really well, but it has a hard time diluting the black color of the body. So you can see this horse has a little bit um, of a lightening to the black body. Um, it's maybe a little bit of a, of a bronze, um, but, but the cream allele has a hard time diluting the black color um, much. However, let's talk about if we have two copies of cream. So if a horse inherits two copies of the cream dilution or the cream allele, that means each of its parents had to themselves have one copy at least that they could have given to their foal. Um, we often call these horses double dilutes because they have a double dose, if you will, um, of, of that particular allele. So if we have a red horse and we have two copies, remember if we had one copy of a palomino, if we have two copies, we have a cremello. Um, Cremellos look pretty white. Um, sometimes, sometimes they might have a little bit of an ivory hint to them, um, but this one in particular looks very white. Um, if you look closely, this horse has blue eyes and it has pink skin. Um, they do tend to be sometimes a little sensitive to the sunlight, um, like a horse that would have otherwise a, a pink nose. Um, so a lot of people do like to have fly masks on these horses in the summer to help protect their, their skin and their eyes a little bit. Um, but that's a cremello. Our bay horse with two copies of cream then turns into a perlino. Um, it can be hard, um, but often the perlino will maintain a little bit of color in its points. This one has almost a yellowish color to its points that will help you distinguish the perlino from the cremello. Um, and again, the difference is this horse has that big E allele um, that's causing it to have black points that get diluted a little bit with this cream. Um, and it has the big A allele, which means that its body would otherwise have been um, red. And then finally, only with two copies of cream um, can this allele really have an effect on the black base coat. Um, but if you do have a black horse with two copies of cream, um, you get a smoky cream. And these can be quite hard to tell apart from perlinas. They will usually maintain a little bit of color in their points. Um, and this one has a little bit of a, um, a little bit of a chocolatey color to it, but is also quite, quite ivory um, in color like the Perlino. Um, and again, all of these horses, whether it's a sorrel, a bay, or a black base coat, um, when they have two copies of cream, they'll have blue eyes and pink skin. So those were the dilutions. Roan, um, one because it's, I think, my favorite coat color. Um, Roan is not a dilution because the dilutions actually change the color of each individual hair. Um, Roan is where there's white hairs that are interspersed with the other hairs um, that, are, that are the normal, if you will, color of the horse. <clears throat> um, so Roan is white hairs on the body. The horse's face and legs generally maintain full color. Um, and Roan is a dominant allele. We use a big RN to denote if the horse has that roan allele, that's gonna give it the white hairs interspersed on its body. Um, so our three base colors here, this is a sorrel horse with roan. We call that a strawberry roan. Um, this horse clearly has black points, um, but its body would have otherwise been red. So it was a bay horse that has roan. Um, and then this is a blue roan. And blue roans sometimes can be hard to tell apart from bay roans. Um, but if you're looking at one and you're not sure what, what the answer is, um, I'd encourage you to look at the muzzle. 
a true blue roan should have a fully black face and its muzzle should stay black. Um, whereas the bay roan, you will see um, evidence of the brown in that horse's head and usually on the muzzle is the best place to see if it has brown in it. Um, so that's how you can hopefully distinguish bay roan from a black or a black horse, a blue roan. <clears throat> So those were changes to um, the base coat color. Um, so now I'm gonna talk a little bit about white patterns or white markings. Um, and these are the five that we're gonna go through. Um, there's a new white patterning allele that seems to be found every month. Um, and so if you're, if you're interested in learning more, I have a um, book that I have the picture of at the end of the presentation that I highly recommend um, to do that. So white is actually due to a lack of pigment. If your horse has white markings, um, it's not modifying the base color of the horse, um, but it's just acting to, in effect, remove pigment from that particular part of the horse's body. Um, so this is, this is something that I find um, really fun to think about and, and can have some consequences on things other than color, is that cells that produce pigment, um, those are the melanocytes, I use that term in our cartoon, um, they're formed from neural crest cells um, when the foal is an embryo. So when that foal is developing in that, in that mare, um, these neural crest cells, which stem from along what will be the backbone of that foal, they, they migrate out from that part to other places in, in the developing embryo. And then when they get to those particular places, um, they work to develop different organ systems um, and different other cell types that will um, make that horse what it is, whether it be color um, or structure. So I'm, I'm pointing this out because neural crest cells are also really important um, for the development of hearing and sight. So we'll come back to that. And in most cases, and actually I can't think of any other cases offhand, alleles that cause white um, are dominant. So you usually only need one copy, um, maybe always, I don't wanna say that, a blanket statement because um, I might be missing one, but, but most often alleles that cause white are dominant. So here might be the one that you would think of first, um, Tobiano, one of the two major um, color patterns in the American paint horse. It is dominant. Um, we'll use a big T or sometimes you see a T-O for the Tobiano allele and little t for the normal uh, recessive allele. Uh, a Tobiano horse has white that crosses its back, um, often has white legs, its tail is more than one color. And if you look at the faces of a Tobiano horse, um, they have traditional markings on their faces. So the one on the, on the left um, has a star, um, one on the right has, has a blaze. Um, you'll see that differs from some of our other white patterns. Um, so, so this is a bay horse that has a big E allele because that has black points, has a big A because its body is brown and not black, and it has at least one copy of the big T, which gives it the white pattern that you see. Um, there, there's some um, ideas that you can tell if a horse is homozygous for Tobiano or not, if it has spots within the white patches. Um, to my knowledge, that hasn't been shown scientifically, but um, in some cases that seems to, to be true. Otherwise, you need to do a genetic test to determine if your horse might have one or two copies of Tobiano. So Sabino is also a white patterning locus. Um, we call that allele SB1. Um, it's dominant, but it's additive. So it's another case where if you have one allele, you get an effect. But if your horse has two alleles of SB1, you're gonna have a bigger effect. Um, and so the, the mare here on the right side, she shows a pretty um, traditional Sabino um, phenotype. She has a big blaze. Sometimes their blaze is a little bit whiter. Um, horses almost always have a, a white on their bottom lip when they're a Sabino. They'll have the socks or stockings that have an irregular um, edge. So instead of being a sock that's straight across, um, they'll often have the pointed edge. You can see in the back one that this traces up um, her leg a little bit, a little bit higher on the other side. Um, if we could zoom in, this mare probably has some white hairs in her flanks. Um, we'll often call that roaning, although it's not a true roan like we just talked about. Um, and they might have belly spots. 
if you have two copies of SB1, like this fool does, you get a lot more white. Not necessarily always this much white, um, but this foal has a tremendous amount of white, and I think she has a little bit of um, pigment on the top of, of her head. So I might call this a medicine hat um, foal. So you'll, you'll see um, Sabino in, in a lot of different breeds. However, when you see horses that are marked like this, if they're Arabians or Clydesdales, it's not attributed to the mutation, the SB1 mutation. Um, and I think that's why we call this Sabino 1, is because we know there's other um, variants that cause a very similar phenotype in these other breeds. They just haven't been identified yet. Splashed white's a fun one. Um, splashed white horses, again, it's a dominant allele. Um, they'll have bald or apron faces, so white across uh, much of the front of their face and usually um, down the sides. Um, they usually have white legs and sometimes the white goes up onto their body like this guy here in, in the corner. Um, some people describe splashed white horses as somebody like held them from the top and dipped them in white. So their white's coming from the legs up um, with the exception of their head. So I have up here that there's alleles SW1 to SW6 and that's because so far there have been six different types of splashed white defined. The sixth one was just published this year um, and it is the, the type that this horse represents in the bottom right. Um, and it was a new mutation in a, in a family of paint horses. Um, so there's, there's six different alleles that can cause splashed white. They're all dominant. Um, if we go back to what I was saying about neural crest cells, which are um, where melanocytes come from, but also important in um, development of, of hearing and eyesight, some of these horses may also be deaf. They aren't all, um, but it is more common with splashed white than, than other white markings. Um, and then further, homozygosity. So if you have two copies of splashed white three, splashed white four, splashed white five, or splashed white six, um, researchers think that might be embryonically lethal, which means that um, if, if an embryo um, is developing that is homozygous for, for any of those four, um, it's not going to make it um, to full term. And usually um, those get terminated early in the pregnancy. You might not even notice um, that that happens. But it goes back to um, these being involved in neural crest cell development. In addition to eyesight and hearing, there's some um, neurological processes that are also developed from those cells. So it makes a little bit of sense that if there's a mutation or, or something that changes how some of those cells act, that it could have um, a consequence that, that isn't good. Um, and in this case, it, it appears to be um, lethal for embryos when they're homozygous. Um, that's not the case for us, splashed white one and two. There are homozygous horses for those that are, that are alive and healthy. So if we um, change a little bit, um, we're going to talk about Overo. Overo as a color um, is dominant, as most of those white markings are. We use the um, allele big O to denote a horse that has this allele. Unlike Tobiano, the white usually doesn't cross the back. It's kind of that the, the edges of the horse stay dark colored um, and the white is within the sides of those horses. Um, we'll often call these frame overos, so you can kind of think of it as a picture frame of dark color around that inside of that horse. Um, if you look at the faces of these horses, they're different than the Tobianos um, because Tobianos usually had a solid face with a star or a blaze or a strip, um, where overo horses on their face, they'll have um, some irregular white markings like these show. Their legs are usually um, dark, or most of their legs are dark, um, and their tails aren't usually multicolored like the Tobianos. So I have here a caveat. This is dominant, um, but this is another association of, of color and things you don't want. Um, in the case where a horse is homozygous for this um, variant, the big O, um, we get what we call a lethal white foal. Um, so this is a really nice example of a frame overo. This horse is a bay um, base coat, dark points, light body, um, and then that color is kind of maintained around that frame. So this lethal white overo syndrome is when there's two copies of overo. Um, the foal is going to be born 
all white or almost all white. It's gonna look great. You're gonna be really excited and really surprised probably of how much white um, came out. Um, but unfortunately, that foal's intestine isn't formed correctly and it's not able um, to, to pass um, manure through. Um, so that foal after it's born will start to show signs of discomfort and colic. Um, and even though people have tried surgery on these foals, um, it, it is fatal. It's something that is unable to be, to be managed surgically. Um, so that's why I'm, I'm a big proponent for genetic testing for, for some of these conditions that are well documented and described. Um, this is one of them. And one of the reasons is that this mare, you probably guessed that she is no ovaro, excuse me, but maybe not. And some ovaros only have a little bit of white, maybe on the belly that you don't really see much of. Um, so it's important that if you're breeding, especially in paints, that you know for sure whether or not your, your breeding stock is carrying um, or has the ovaro allele to make sure that you don't breed two ovaro horses together. Um, so for that reason, if you wanna have a herd of ovaros, that's really hard to do um, because you can't guarantee that you'll ever have an ovaro offspring, um, but it's important to, to try to avoid this condition of lethal white ovaro. Appaloosa color, I left this to, to basically the last because Appaloosas are, are very um, complicated, if you will. And although a lot is understood now about their coat color patterns, there's, there's still some things that aren't. Um, and so the, the leopard spotting allele um, is determined by this gene called TRPM1. Um, it is dominant, and we call that dominant allele big LP and the other allele little LP. Um, if your horse doesn't have a dominant allele, it doesn't have spots. And so all of your quarter horses, um, any solid color horse has little LP, little LP as the genotype for this locus. However, if there's one copy of the big LP, you get white patch on the body, maybe the whole body, maybe just the rump, with pigmented spots within that patch. So all three of these horses have the genotype big LP, little LP. They're all heterozygous. And if we add one more of a leopard locus to the horse, so their genotype is homozygous for big LP, they have the white patch again, that might be its whole body, might just be its rump, but within that white patch, there are no spots. And so like the extra copy of this basically was so much white, it took away the spots within each of those locations, okay? So we'll talk in a minute about why this horse is all white and that one only has white on its rear. Um, but first I'm gonna have the, the Debbie Downer part and talk about um, something unwanted that's associated with leopard spotting. Um, so leopard spotting locus is also associated with night blindness. Um, and so if your horse is homozygous for the leopard spotting locus, so those are the ones that are all white or have the all white patches on their rump, um, they have night blindness, which means their vision is impaired in the dark. Kind of makes sense from what it's called. It's something they're born with. It doesn't get worse as they get older. Um, a lot of horses manage with this just fine because that's what they know. Um, but if your horse does have this genotype, um, it is good to know because if you take that horse somewhere new or maybe on a trail ride and you're getting in um, back to camp um, when it's getting dark, the horse might have a little bit of trouble and you might just want to be a little extra careful about, about where you're going with him or her um, because their, their vision will be slightly impaired. The other eye issue that some Appaloosas have that's linked to the um, leopard spotting locus, um, and it doesn't matter whether it's homozygous or heterozygous in this case, um, is ERU or equine recurrent uveitis. This is often called moon blindness. Um, unlike night blindness, they're not born with it. Um, they're just more prone to having these issues where their, their um, uveal tract of their eye will become inflamed. Um, they might get teary, they'll have some issues seeing. Um, if it's not treated, it can lead to blindness. Um, but in the name, the recurrent part of this name, this is recurring. Um, even though you treat it, it will get better. Um, they're more prone to having it happen um, more often. So two eye things to be aware of with um, Appaloosa horses. Let's go back to this, this whole thing about whether the horse is 
has light across its whole body or just on its own. Um, so a few years ago, this other gene, um, PATN1, was identified. Um, so this is another example of epistasis, where what happens at one locus determines whether or not we can see what the genotype is at the other. Um, so the PAT1 allele is also dominant, and you can only see it if there's the big LP allele present at that leopard spotting locus. Um, so we'll go through the pictures again. The top, these horses are homozygous little LP, which means they don't have the ability to have those spots or those white patches. Um, so it doesn't matter whether or not the allele has or doesn't have the PAT in one locus. There's no spots to be distributed on the body. We have our heterozygote. Um, remember that that makes white, spot, white, white patches with pigmented spots within them. Um, if the horse does not have the PAT1 allele, that is restricted to the rump of that animal, whereas if the horse has one or more copies of the PAT1 allele, that's going to cover the whole body of that horse. So this is an instance where you could breed this horse um, to, to one that has a copy of, of leopard um, spotting but only has spots on its rump and get a horse that has white across its whole body with spots. Um, because this could contribute this PAT1 locus that you don't even know, it, might not even know it has um, to its offspring. So we take it a step further and we go to the homozygotes for the big LP. Um, this is not, not a great picture for a publication, but this horse does have a little white patch on its rump. Um, the take home message is if it doesn't have the PAT1 allele, that's not the, the spotting is white patches are not distributed across the body. Whereas if it has a PAT1 allele, um, that white is distributed across the whole body. And in this case, we get this horse that, that really doesn't even have spots within the white um, because of the LPLP um, and it covers its whole body with a PATN1. <clears throat> okay. So everything I've told you holds true with the exception of if gray is present. So gray is dominant over everything, and it's, it's epistatic, if you want to think of that term again, over everything else. Um, the alleles are big G for gray, um, and little g, if you don't have gray, it is dominant. Um, a horse is never born gray, so you can have um, a foal, and you'll think, well, I got a nice little bay foal, um, but then a few months later, you start to see white around its eyes, um, and then a few years later, that horse is gonna be completely gray. Um, so that white around the foal's eyes is often the first sign um, if that foal is indeed going to be a gray horse. And again, since it's dominant, you can't have a foal that's gray unless one of the parents is gray. Gray gets confused with roan, um, but I, I will suggest that you can try to tell these two apart by looking at the face. Um, if you remember roan, the face usually maintains the, the darker color, whereas if it's a gray, the face is the first place often that turns gray. So if the head of the horse looks like it has white hairs in it, the horse is probably a gray, whereas if the head doesn't, it's probably a roan. And here's some examples. Um, unfortunately, this isn't the same horse, but this is an example of gray changes with age. Um, so this horse is a black base coat, it has the big A, so it's a bay, um, has at least one copy of gray. You can see it's almost like little goggles around his eyes as he starts shedding and the new hairs come in. Um, this is the first place often you'll see it. Um, gray is progressive, so a younger horse with gray, again, see how this horse's face was the first to really turn white, um, but as it gets older, the body hairs will be replaced with white hairs. Um, it ages more, and you're gonna see more um, white hairs come in, and then often when they get older, you'll see an almost white horse. Um, People will call those white horses, um, but you can say, I know better than that. There really aren't any true white horses. Um, that's probably a horse that's gone gray. Um, gray horses, they'll maintain the dark pigment. Um, if that's what they had, um, you can get confusing things. Though you could get a cremello that, that turns gray. So it could have pink pigment and blue eyes. Um, that might make you think that that horse is albino, but it, it actually was a cremello that also had a gray gene. Um, all things are not always straightforward. Um, gray horses have a higher incidence of melanoma than other coat colors. Um, and so this is a melanoma on the base of a tail of a horse. 
um, when you find them like this, they can usually be removed and not cause issues. Um, sometimes melanomas can develop internally. Um, in that case, you don't necessarily know they're there and they can cause issues. Um, but generally, they're, they're fairly easy to deal with, um, but they'll be more and more as the horse gets older. Um, and it might be something that, that help makes you um, have to make a decision on that horse's um, management. If a horse is homozygous for gray, so if they're big G, big G, not only do, their, do they gray faster in their body, um, but they're also at a higher risk for melanoma than horses that are heterozygous, so they have one copy of big G. Um, as an aside, it's really interesting, but Arabian horses seem to have melanomas, um, gray Arabian horses seem to have melanomas a lot um, higher frequency than um, gray quarter horses, for instance. Um, and so researchers are trying to understand what's different um, about the different breeds, excuse me, that makes Arabians develop melanomas, um, even though quarter horses with the same genotype might not. Okay, so hopefully um, you, you've learned some things um, and had a little bit of fun. Um, I think colors are fun, they're not always simple. Um, so like I said, every horse has a genotype for every color gene. Um, the same genes that your dog has, that we have, etc. cetera. Um, we just don't often say the horse's full entire color genotype. Um, so if we have a bay horse, big E, big A, we have a cream dilution, we have a big CR, we have a dun dilution, big D, we'll call that a dun skin. So it's a buck skin with the dun, so a dun skin. But that horse actually has two alleles for roan, two alleles for sabino, um, two alleles for splash white one, splash white two, et cetera. We just generally don't say all these genotypes if they're not ones that change what that horse looks like. Um, but if you're thinking about what colors you might get from particular mating, you do, do need to think about what does this horse have that even though it doesn't affect what color this horse is, it might affect what color its baby will be. Um, so I'm gonna put in a shameless plug for work that's going on in my lab. Um, I have some students who are working on trying to understand the genetic basis of Roan and Sabino in Clydesdales and Shires. Um, so we might call this Clydesdale a Sabino because it has irregular white socks, white in the lip, big white blaze. Um, but as I mentioned, Clydesdales and Norarabians have the Sabino 1 mutation that other breeds do. Um, and then clearly this Clydesdale is a very different body color than this one. Um, if I saw this horse, um, I would probably call it a roan. Um, however, similar to Sabino, <clears throat> Clydesdales don't have the same mutation that causes roan in quarter horses and some other breeds. Um, so we're working to try to understand what is making these Clydesdales have these color patterns um, different than those other breeds. <clears throat> and finally, um, this is the book that I mentioned. So Dr. Slunenberg and Ballone um, revised the original equine color genetics book that I used to read and, and enjoy learning from um, just a few years ago. So this was out in 2017. They go through not only the genetics that are known, but also um, colors that we don't understand the genetics of. Um, so it's a very good resource if you wanna learn more about particular coat colors. Um, so with that, I, I appreciate you, your attention and your attendance. Um, if you have questions, please shoot them in chat. If you have questions and you're watching this as a recording, um, my email was on that slide earlier. Feel free to, to shoot me an email. We love to um, talk to people about, about coat color. Um, if you have a Clyde still that you want to um, contribute DNA from for our study, we'd also love to hear from you. That I will end. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. That was a great presentation and I know I learned a lot. It looks like we have someone in the chat Bruce Treffer says, brown versus bay. Thanks, Bruce, Bruce for that hard question. <clears throat> um, so it's not completely understood yet, but um, it's fairly well agreed upon that brown is a different allele at that A locus, that ASIP locus. Um, and so there's, there's more than just two alleles there. Um, and I, I wish I could tell you more. Um, but, but that's what it seems to be. Um, those brown horses often have, some people call them mule nose. So they have a lighter um, color around their muzzle and then in their flanks. Um, and we believe it's another allele at ASIP, but that's not determined. Hopefully that answers your question, Bruce. 
Um, if you guys have any more questions, again, um, you are welcome to email Jessica at her email on that previous slide. Thank you guys for getting on tonight. Uh, turn in, tune in next week for our next topic that will be over equine um, first aid kits and what you should put in yours and why. But other than that, I hope everyone has a good night. Thank you.